ordain him into the ministry. And, uh, it's interesting to me as a pastor because actually the people of our congregation have not uh, really been so much the beneficiaries of Austin's ministry as much as people in Africa. I, I told him, I've always told my children, it didn't matter to me what they did as long as what they did was righteous. And uh, I've watched parents try and force their kids to do things and inevitably the kids do the opposite of what their parents try and force them to do. And so I never encouraged my children in the ministry. I mean, I didn't discourage them, but it's impossible to manufacture the call of God. And uh, it was in 1998, I was preaching in Uganda, in Kampala, Uganda, and the pastor that I was preaching for, ministering with, asked Austin to do the youth service. And so Austin agreed, and uh, so I sat there and listened to my son preach for the very first time. He was 16. And as a parent, sometimes you wonder if your kids are ever paying attention to you. <laughs> Anybody but me ever wonder that? Are these kids paying attention? And, uh, but it was really on that Sunday afternoon it dawned on me, wow, he has been paying attention. And he's been listening. And uh, I thought the message sounded very familiar. And, uh, and so I've taken him back to Africa each year. The most not being in the ministry, most of you are not in the ministry, you wouldn't understand it, but the, the most discriminating, the toughest audience is the United States audience. And uh, when you go overseas, people just love you, they accept you, they receive you. And also somehow, God is not different. It's only that our expectations are different. And you know, we license people to preach the gospel and we ordain people to preach the gospel. I personally believe and this church believes that we should not ordain people until they have fruit until they have a proven track record and I've watched Austin over the last three and a half years since he began preaching the gospel and I've seen the fruit I remember one evening in uh, Kampala again back in Uganda two years ago I guess it was in 99 I was off in one area outside of Kampala pioneering a church and Austin was across town in some other area pioneering a, a different church and uh, holding outdoor crusades, both of us. And my meeting finished and the driver said, well, you want to go on and see if, if, if Austin is done or if he's still preaching, maybe we could swing by and pick him up. You know, we had two different transports. And I said, sure, that'd be great. And so we drove over to the other side of town. And uh, so there was Austin ministering, but he didn't know I was there. And I think that that was interesting on my part. Uh, it was fascinating that evening to sit there in the van and watch my son cast devils out of people and lay hands on people and then call for testimonies and people give testimonies of their ailments disappearing and uh, being removed by the power, by the anointing of the Lord. And there's a church there uh, this evening on the outskirts of Kampala, Uganda, where Austin Lingerfeld uh, held that meeting and pioneered that church. And uh, so, sometimes my wife says he's more African than American. He, was, he spent his first year in uh, Kenya, and he's always had an openness for all kinds of people. I personally don't believe somebody belongs in the ministry if they don't have an openness for all kinds of people. Because we are called not to people who look like us. We are called to the nations. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is for the nations. In this church every Sunday morning, we have 30 nations of the earth represented. Just standing in front of us during the baby dedication, we had uh, three nations represented. And so that's the kind of a church you're sitting in. And anybody who represents us ought to be that kind of a person. Whether a man or a woman, they ought to be international in perspective understanding that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a calling to every kindred, every tongue, and every tribe, every kind of people. Can you say amen? amen. And so my wife is coming, Austin Lingerfeld, come, and Dr. T.L. Osborne's coming. And Dr. Osborne is so kind and so gracious. He has agreed to assist us here this evening and to give Austin a charge. 
and to assist us in praying over Austin Lingerfeld this evening, ordaining Austin into the ministry. Austin, this is an important day for you. Let me turn this on and I won't need this. This is an important day for you. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, what would you say to the people at this, at this milestone of your life? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing when you travel the world and you realize that there's more to life than just, you know, what you have here at home. There's more to life than, you know, what you might have or, you know, who your family is. That there's, you know, something, it's just, it's, it's almost impossible to describe. But for me, I just had to, when I was uh, in 1996, I reached a real turning point in my life. And I felt the, God of, the call of God upon my life. And my dad took me overseas, and when that happened, my entire life changed, my entire outlook changed, and I realized that there's more to life than what I want, there's more to life than what I might desire, that it's all about God, and it's all about other people. Because we can talk about the problems of the world all we want, we can talk about this and that all we want, but unless somebody decides that they're going to do something about it, then nothing is going to be done. So I've decided, you know, once I finish with my school, I'm gone. We're going to make a difference. Hold that up there for me. I want to. I want to hold this. So, so. I want to read you his charge, not mine. Henceforth, I call you not a servant, for the servant doesn't know what his Lord does. But I call you a friend. Then he makes a statement, powerful statement, Austin. For all things I've heard of my Father, I've made known to you. Can you take that? That's big. That's big. We come from God. We come from God. See, he makes known to us what the Father wants. We hear his voice. For you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name he'll give it to you believe that that'll come to pass you'll see that let me read you something else he said he ordained 12 it says here I don't think these words are just for those 12. Those were the first 12. You'd make 13, see. So he ordained them. Why? Such simple things. Never forget these. That 
that you should be with him. Isn't that wonderful? He says, lo, I am with you. Thank God we are with him. We never lose him. He ordained them that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach the gospel. And he ordained them that they might have power. Not to pray for power, to try to get the power, not to fast a long time and get the power, but to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Jesus said that. That's what the Bible says. And I want to read you one more thing. Paul, in his witness about his calling, never forget this. It's very, very important. He witnessed and he made this statement as he addressed the people. He said, the God of our fathers, this, this, is, what, this is what Jesus said, said to him. I looked upon him, he said. And he said, the God of our fathers, Ananias, the God of our fathers has chosen you. You believe that, don't you? Some people, that's so distant, it's impossible to grasp. It's too big. Like that Hindu said, that I think it would be the greatest sin in the world to bother the omnipotent one on my account. See, but you've learned truth. And you know that the Father, the creator of the world, has looked down and saw you. You were a baby one time like that beautiful little baby tonight. And your parents gave you to God. <clears throat> and now here you stand, and we read what Ananias said to Paul. The God of our Father has chose you, Austin. Why? Listen to these things. That you should know his will. Your, your, your heart is beating with the will of God. What's the will of God? What's good for God? What's good for people? What's good for you is God's will. See, and you found that out. No question. Helping people that don't know is God's will. He's chosen you that you should know his will. Number two, that you should see. See that just one. And I think that's one of the greatest statements in the Bible for a minister. That you should see that just one. What does that mean? That you, you should see, you should perceive, you should understand righteousness the just one we're just because he made us just he's ordained you if you see that just one then you'll preach the gospel see because you know that there's no righteousness in you but it's his righteousness that has come to you you have beheld him. You have perceived him. You have seen him. You see him every day, that just one. And that you should hear the voice of his mouth. You'll hear his voice. You've already heard his voice. You're going to hear it a lot. Keep your antenna high. You'll hear. You'll pick up the signal. It'll become more and more familiar to you. You're ordained. You're chosen to know his will, to see righteousness through Christ, and to hear the voice of his mouth. You will hear the voice of his mouth, Austin. And the fourth thing, for you shall be his witness unto all people, of what you've seen and heard. That's your ministry. That's your sermon. That comprises your ministry. You've seen him tell the hurting world. Those people in those countries, they've seen, they haven't seen him. We can tell them, <clears throat> we can tell them 
You want me to read the rest of it? Now, what are you waiting on? Why tearest thou? See? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. But it's big business for a young man like this. Okay. Mama, you're in this thing. Put your hand out. Set your hand out to Austin. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I lay this Bible on his shoulders and I lay my hands on his body. We touch him. Thank you, Lord. We've seen a hurting world. Austin <clears throat> is feeling that pull to hurting people. Thank you for this. This is what Paul felt. The Jews weren't interested in those hurting poor people of other tribes and other nations, but Paul was. And he taught us and he showed us. He said, how are they going to believe if they don't hear? How are they going to hear if we don't tell them? Here we are. You've chosen Austin to tell the world about you. And you will confirm him as you were confirmed, Lord, by signs and miracles and wonders. When Austin preaches, may there be power, Pentecostal, Holy Ghost, power, as was upon Peter that day, that he may preach with power and, and assurance and confidence, knowing that he speaks the message of God. And when he lays his hands on sick people, may devils leave and sicknesses die in the name of Jesus. Guide him in his ministry. Guide him in leadership. For he will become a leader as he goes and ministers to hurting people throughout the world. Every new people that he looks into the eyes of, he'll come back bigger, fuller, hallelujah, fuller. They will be in him. Africa is in him. Kenya is in him. Thank you. Uganda's in him. The people are there. He closes his eyes. He sees them. Every people that he ministers to will be in him. And that becomes a leader. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his life. Thank you, Lord. We don't feel like we ordain him. We feel like we stand here in honor of your ordination. You have chosen him. Thank you, Lord, that you've chosen him. And we stand here and applaud your choice. And thank you that you chose him to go, to know your will, to hear your voice, to see that just one, to have power to heal sicknesses and cast out devils. So be it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead. And let everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Give me a hug, Austin. Hallelujah. Well, God is good. Well, we're going to have to change Dr. Osborne's microphone. So in the meantime, I want you to stand up. I want you to find a different dozen people. I want you to cross the aisles. Do it. Stand up. Find a different dozen. You can stretch your friendliness. Amen. Cross the aisle. Can you say amen? Amen. And uh, we live in a day and an age of technology. And I think if we're not careful, we become too dependent on technology. We become too dependent on radio, television, internet, email, and nothing is quite the same as ministering to people personally. And that's why I know some people say, well, you know, tech, the television's so much greater than being there in a crusade. But I, I, I disagree because uh, even though I'm on television, it can be very impersonal. And if you get over into an area people don't like, they just change the channel. You know, click, click, 
and then the gospel's gone. And a lot of times, too, Christian television is where the gospel's already been. But Dr. Osborne and his ministry has gone to more than 80 nations of the world, and he's gone where the gospel wasn't. And that's where the gospel needs to go. Can you say amen? amen. And uh, we're so privileged and honored to have Dr. Osborne with us. No one has preached to more people in person than Dr. T.L. Osborne. No one has uh, seen more people come to Christ in person than Dr. Osborne. I'm talking about since the Apostle Paul. And uh, no one has seen more miracles firsthand uh, in person than Dr. T.L. Osborne. So it's a great joy and privilege and honor. Can you say amen for Dr. Osborne to be with us on this Easter Sunday, 2001? So will you help me? Let's give Dr. T.L. Osborne a warm greeting and welcome this evening. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. you know those things. Come on. They, how can they be true? Oh, not because of any special faith or any special anointing or anything like that. Just because I started so long ago and stayed at it so far in the world. My goodness, and it's so wonderful. Hallelujah. Uh, I hear those. I, I can't hardly believe them myself. But, but uh, thank God. It's wonderful. And so I, I want you to put up your hand and say hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm alive today. In the, 21st in the 21st century. I'm here. I'm here. Poor, devil. Poor devil. I'm here. I'm here. Alive. Alive. With power. With, power. with life. With Me. Me. I'm here. I'm here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. I want to ask you to play me a, a song. You're so good. I want to hear you. Yeah, play for me. You like that? 
<laughs> Thank you. That was for me. Thank you. And he's not even 30 years old yet. <laughs> you know how old he is? I won't tell. It's none of my business. But you know, he's just a kid. He's just a kid. When he grows up, he's going to be terrific. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. I just had to hear that. I love that kind of music. Somebody, I know you didn't understand it. It was over your head. Uh, that don't mean you're dumb. It just means, it just it means in music you don't hear that. You have to hear music. You have to hear music. I tell when I can I leaned over to the pastor when I came in this morning. I said, you've had that piano tune. He said, yeah. I just had it tuned. I said, it's a bell. It's beautiful. <laughs> so much for that. I believe in music. Austin, let's take music to Russia. They need a song. I, tell, I told them over there, you know, they don't smile. Nah, they're learning to smile. Some of them are. Most of them. I told them when I was there before, I said, buy yourself a mirror and look at it. Look at yourself and learn to smile. And learn. I said, make your, make your lines go up instead of down. I had them in a good mood, so they were taking it from me. I said, because we're supposed to be happy. Well, what can you be happy about if you're a communist or under a communist do, uh, dictator? Nothing to be happy about because you just do one thing every day. You get up, you go down so many floors, you go down a certain sidewalk, go there, catch that car and go there, go into the factory and work and come back. That's the only route. You do that every day of your life. You don't know anything different. Sad. Nothing to smile about. We got to take a smile to the people. Hallelujah. We're so rich over here. We got music. Yeah. Is Tom and Ellen here? Tom and Ellen, have I missed you? I've been looking for you. You were here this morning. I'm sorry I didn't see them. Nice couple that used to come to our church in, in Tulsa. Now, you know that this morning I preached the same scriptures that I preached one year ago. Some of you may have thought I'm getting old and senile and didn't remember that. No, I knew all about that. When I came down here, I was thinking, what, what, what do they need? What, what, how can I help the people there? And the Lord said, tell them again. Tell them again. Because I preach on the resurrection probably more than anything else, any other single subject. Because all over the world, that is what makes the difference in Christianity and the religions of those countries. So I am a resurrection preacher. I love to preach the resurrection. You can imagine how many different ways burn in me to tell people about the resurrected Christ. But coming down here, I thought it was so strange and the Lord kept nudging me. Just say it again. They need it again. Say it again. That's why I did it. I didn't make any apology. I just, I just buckled in and went over the same verses. Do any of you remember that last year? Yeah. Good preaching. Good stuff. Now tonight, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't finish that sermon last year. And I didn't finish it this morning. And I want to take you a little bit further in some ideas. But as a prelude, I want to read some verses to some of them I read last year. But listen, why, why, would, why would I come down here and preach the same sermon two holidays in a row? Must be a reason. I don't ask questions. If I'm led to do something, I do it. I don't care what people think of me. I'm going to do it. I obey God. I believe in that. God wants these verses riveted, tattooed in your spirit. Because, listen to me, folks. I'm going to talk tonight about if there's no resurrection. And, and let me just cut across and say, if there's no resurrection, then we have no hope and we're in trouble. And we don't have anything but another religious philosophy. But let's see if we've got more than, than that tonight. And so, let, let me read to you. Let me start by reading this. Oh, I love to read this. In Romans, it's Living Bible. It's Romans 5, and I'm going to take some verses from verse 1 to 11. Just drink. Say, I'll drink. I'll drink. Say, God's word is food to me. Is food. 
sweeter than honey. We can have real peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Say amen. amen. He has brought us, what's he done? He has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand. Oh, I believe that. That's why I talked like I did to Austin. I believe that. And we can actually become all that God has in mind for us to be. Amen. Amen. When we were utterly, I wish I could get the church to understand this, Christians around the world. See, see I say this so many times, Salvation was not our idea. We never asked for it. We never searched for it. We didn't want it. We didn't try to get it. We didn't ask him to fix it for us. No, it was his idea. Meaning, we didn't want him. He wanted us. Meaning, it's wonderful to be loved. I'm loved. God needs me, wants me, believes in me. Oh boy, you folks tonight, you sang my sermon. You sang all that good stuff. When we were utterly helpless, with no way of escape, Christ, when we were in that shape, Christ came and died for us sinners who had no use for him. Wasn't our idea. We didn't want it. We were sinners. We weren't seeking anything. We didn't want nothing from God. But God wanted us. And He came and died for us sinners when we had no use for Him. Powerful. God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Has that nickel dropped in you yet? While I don't care about him, he cares about me. When I didn't seek him, he sought me. When I didn't want him, he wanted me. What did he see in me? Beautiful things. Put God, turn God loose in, your, in you. You're beautiful. Mean people, you know, get God in them. They're beautiful. Now, he has declared us. Are you ready for this? You know what it's going to say a lot of you. He has now, he, since he died for us, he has declared us not guilty. That's what the Living Bible says. I like those words. Not guilty. I'm not guilty. That's why... I can stand before God in His righteousness. What is righteousness? The ability to stand before God in the presence of God without any sense of fear or intimidation or guilt or inferiority. Righteousness. Not your righteousness. His righteousness is imputed to you your sins have been charged to his account and his righteousness has been credited to your account. And you didn't want it. But he did it. And all you have to do is hear about it and believe it. Do you believe it? I believe it. Say, I believe. I believe. Hallelujah. I heard of an infidel hated God but a preacher uh, he was in trouble he was dying and he looked out the window and the preacher told him he said you look out the window you look at the sky you look at the trees and you just look up and you say I believe I believe you just keep saying that <laughs> and he got converted he got converted I believe those are the strongest words in the world I don't believe that'll tear you up that'll send you to hell that'll destroy you 
That'll put a frown on your face. That'll take joy out of your heart. Negative stuff will kill you. I believe. Hallelujah. We were brought back to God by the death of His Son. What blessing He now has for us now that we are His friends. Can you take that? Say, I can take it. I'm His, I'm his friend. I'm his friend. Now, we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us the friends of God. That's the warmest word God can use. I always love that. He called Abraham his friend. And he calls me his friend. He treats me and Abraham the same. Wonderful. We're friends of God. All because, not of what we did, but because of what he did. Now, let me read you some more. Paul takes up here now, and he begins to elucidate this wonderful stuff that, uh, that, that I read to you this morning that, 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 that happened. Paul says, Romans 4, 24, God's, now listen to this. Say, I'm listening. I'm listening. See, it's God speaking. It's not me, I'm reading it from his word. Take it in your spirit. Let it, let it, let it, let it uh, grow in your spirit. God, God's righteousness is credited to all who believe in Jesus Christ and who believe in God who raised him from the dead. Say, I believe, I believe. God raised Jesus from the dead according to the scriptures and because he lives I live hallelujah I am alive today because he is alive God's righteousness is credited to all who believe in Jesus and who believe in God who raised him from the dead verse 25 he was put to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. What does that mean? For our, raised for our justification. His resurrection justifies our faith in Him. See, we believe in Him. But what is He? What's he done? How do we know? Are we sure? Who is he? What did he do? Were you there? Did it really happen? What happened? They killed him. He died. He bled. He died. They put him in a tomb. Maybe they stole his body. How do we know? He was raised to life for our justification. We believe in him. We follow him. People have told us about him. He was raised to life to justify our faith. Had he not raised from the dead, our faith would be vain. He was raised to life for our justification. Had he not come back to life, all that he taught was fakery. All that he taught, maybe not fakery, philosophy. Good ideas, beautiful thoughts. Beautiful phrases. Had he not raised from the dead, that's all there would be to Christianity. How do we know Christianity is not just another nice philosophy? Another nice religion. Like Hinduism. And Islam. And, and, uh, and Shintoism. And Confucianism. How do we know Christianity is not like that? The Muslims say you don't know. They tell us, and, 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 and they have some pretty serious arguments. They say, look, you can't even prove where your New Testament came from. And the preachers are still fussing about it. They don't know. Nobody knows for sure that Mark wrote Mark and Luke wrote Luke and all that. The theologians are still fussing about it. They never have decided who wrote Hebrews. 
and, and, and Allah, you know, so the Muslims throw that at us. They say, we know Muhammad wrote what our book. We know that, but you Christians don't know. What, how do we know? We don't just have another religion, another philosophy. Did you ever think about that? Hey, I think about that because I'm out there meeting those people. I've got to deal with them. Seas of people, oceans of people out there. I, I'm the wrong color. I'm the wrong, speak the wrong language. I, I'm from the wrong country. Uh, and, and here I'm a stranger surrounded by all these people and witch doctors are there and, 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 and devil possessed people and lepers and, and uh, uh, blind people and, and here I am telling about this God. How do we know that I haven't just brought another philosophy? We better know. But the way we know, we have the miraculous. But we would not have the miraculous if Jesus Christ had not raised from the dead. When he came back from the dead, he was able to say, because I live, you live also. You ever think about that? Have you thought serious about that? That's a very, very important statement. Romans 6, 8. Now, if we be dead with him, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now, we all put that in the future. Yeah, hallelujah, resurrection morning comes and we're all going to go away and live with him. No, no, no. Let's talk about it right now. If we be, if we identify with his death on the cross, then we also identify in the same way with his resurrection from the dead. We identify with him all the steps through. We died when he died. Our old life was buried when he was buried. And when he came back to life, we came back to life. That's our faith. We believe that. Now, that would be philosophy, except we have the proof. And I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. I tell sometimes the preachers when I know there's some real rascals in the crowd, some people that are real skeptics and don't believe. I say, hey, don't listen to these guys that haven't been anywhere. Listen to me. I know. <laughs> I pull rank on them, you know. I say, I've been there. I've been there where you've got to prove whether you've got a God or you haven't got a God. And, and that, that helps some of them, not all of them. But <laughs> now look, Romans 6 and 8. If we be dead with him, listen to this. We believe we shall also live with him. Not in the future, now. We died, now he came back to life. He was raised for our justification. His resurrection justifies our faith. Our faith is made valid only because he came back from the dead. He didn't stay dead. Listen, this was quoted again. That was in Romans. Then Paul said it again in 2 Timothy 2.11. It is a faithful saying, he said. It, are you hearing me? It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And we say that's the future. No, now, listen. I want to prove it. Listen. Listen to Romans 5. If we have been planted, I don't mean that, I'm, I'm sorry, Romans 6, verse 5. If we have been planted together, now listen to this, in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now we put that all to resurrection day. No, 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 no. That's not what Paul's talking about. If we were planted in death, we are identified in life. Resurrection life. I've got the life in me that brought Jesus back from the dead. That's not, that's not hope. That, that's, that's reality. Do you have that life in you? That is what quickens us. What gives life to us. Now listen. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Listen to this. Knowing this, that our old person is crucified with him. Is yours? Is yours? 
Say, mine is. Mine is. Say, I'm crucified. I'm crucified. With, Christ. With Christ. When he died, he died. I died. I died. When he was crucified, he I was crucified. And when he came back from the dead, say it out loud. Wow, look at me. Wow, look at me. I came to. I, came I, live. I live. He lived. He lived. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I died with him, I live with him. Now listen, knowing this, that our old person is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth, we should not serve sin. No, we're new. See, we're talking about life now. Not resurrection day. That'll come. But now, now, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Yeah, we know that. That's why we have life. Because our old, our old sinful life died. Now, we're freed from sin. And we live with the new kind of life. Resurrection life. The resurrection is our justification. The resurrection justifies our faith, validates our faith, underscores our faith, gives evidence of our faith. Now listen to me. The whole world, I, I preach this to preachers. Everywhere I go, I try to get this across. Uh, uh, you look like a bunch of preachers to me. You're so smart. You're such good people. So beautiful. You, you're, you're strong in God. And, 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 and we've, we've got to remember that we are ministers of the resurrection. Do you believe that? Yes. We live because of him. Look, look, look. For he, he that's dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, huh? Right now, are you dead now with Christ? Yes, yes, yes. It's a process all the time. Goes on. I die daily. Meaning, I always constantly look, as I told Austin tonight in, in, in the ordination meeting, we see that just one. We look upon him always and draw life from him. He is our life. He lives, we live. He died, we died. He was buried, we were buried. He came back, we came back. When he came back, he justified our faith and validated us as believers. I start saying, we, I tell preachers everywhere, what we preach, the gospel, listen to this, this will be hard for some of you to take. Remember Paul, Peter said to Paul, some things are hard to understand that he says. But hang on here, it'll help you. I've been a long way, I know what I'm talking about. When, 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 when we believe in this resurrection, something is different. Without it, without it, listen, without it, our preaching is incredible. You know what incredible means? Unbelievable. Not believable. The God, I tell preachers, the gospel, as it is written, is not believable. It's not logical. It don't make sense. It's incredible. Why do I say that? Okay. I stand up here and tell us, and see, I live this life. I go out here, I, I meet a sea, a, an ocean of people. And I have the audacity to come from a foreign country, work through an interpreter, and tell them about this Jesus, a Jew, lived 2,000 years ago. And I tell them how that he lived and healed and blessed. Okay, they'll take that. that. That's history. Okay, I can't prove it. They can't prove it didn't happen. So okay, they, they'll take that. And then I come on down to, to these religious people who accused him and lied on him because he was messing up their religion. And finally, they got an order to execute him, to crucify him. And he died on a cross, crucified by Romans. There in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified. I proclaim that to them. Then I proclaim to them. Don't forget this. I proclaim to them, as I do to you tonight, when he died, 
My life, my old life died. My sins died. He assumed my guilt and took up on himself all of my guilt and all of the punishment that the law of Moses says should fall on me, Jesus, in his love, a Jew 2,000 years ago, said, no, 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 I love that person. I'm incredible. Love me? They don't even know me. That's 2,000 years ago. It's crazy. It's a crazy story. Do you ever think about it like that? No, no, no. He loved me. And I tell him, I say, and when he died, he assumed all of my guilt and my sins. And when he died on the cross, he shouldn't have died. They killed the wrong man. I'm the one they should have killed. I was the one that should have been crucified. It was my sin. He did not sin. I sinned. But he died for me and you. That's incredible. That's incredible. And then I have the audacity to go a little bit further. And I tell them, they, before they crucified him, they took him to the whipping post. And they tied him and they beat him with that whip and jerked chunks of meat out of his back and plowed his back like a farmer plows a field. And the prophet said he was suffering surely, for sure. A lot of things you may not be sure of, but you can be sure he bore our diseases and carried our pains. Incredible. Incredible. We shout about it, but to people that don't know, believe me, I've been there. Incredible. It don't make sense. What you're going to do? He was raised for our justification. Because he came back from the dead, that justifies my faith. His coming back from the dead was a miracle. Okay, but they say, but I wasn't there. I don't know. I think they stole his body. I don't think, I don't think. So what are you going to do? What, what's going to be your next step now if you don't believe in miracles? They're going to tell you, oh, I don't believe he raised from the dead. That's just, that's just, that's just a fable. They just, uh, read history. They say they stole his body. He didn't come back from the dead. How do I know? Sure, for we who believe, his resurrection was my justification. My faith is justified. I'm anchored. I'm validated. Bless God, I can stand before the devil, look in between the horns and say, Oh boy, Jesus came back from the dead and you've been whipped ever since. Amen. You don't bother me. See, I know that, but I'm a believer. I'm a believer. What are we going to say to them people that are not believers? They've never heard this. This is a fairy story. You ever hear Hindu stories? They're intriguing. Beautiful stories the Hindus have. Philosophy. They can't prove one of them. And here I come with a story. What are you going to do if you go out there and you can't prove it? The Bible says in, in Acts 2.22, Jesus of Nazareth approved of God by miracles and signs and wonders. Jesus, the Son of God, had to have validation from his Father. Otherwise, he would have looked like a philosopher. Am I talking uh, too crazy? Hey, hey, the country was full of philosophers. The, the descendants of Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. Oh, those Greek philosophers were everywhere. And the Hebrews had a lot of philosophers too. <laughs> and, and, and hey, don't forget, don't forget where, 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 where the Holy Land is located. It's located and, and, and do you know the, the, the trade routes all converge on Jerusalem. They, can, they come from China, up around the Himalayas. They come from, from India, all across there, across the, the, the Indian Ocean and the, and the Mediterranean Sea. And they all converge. All of those trade routes, camel caravans, Thousands of traders and religious philosophers 
galore coming along with the crowd bringing their yarns to tell the people. And all of them trotting around with their little groups of disciples that they make and, and get under a shade tree like Muslims do in Africa and, and, and pull out their little books or their little stories and tell them all this stuff. Philosophers, Hindus, galore. The Hindus, they stretch from India plumb across to Morocco. Did you know that? All of that area was the Sanskrit language, which is the base used in Hinduism. All of that stuff. The Hindus galore. And poor Paul comes, is preaching that kind of stuff. And those people, ever kind of a, an imaginable uh, uh, philosophy was being propagated among the people. And then here comes this Jesus. Well, was he just another one? Was he? Was he? Hey. I don't know if I told you this before, but the greatest philosopher that ever came out of India was named... Uh, oh, uh, Sha uh, I've lost it. Chandra Karach Karachi. Something, something like that. I forget it. The greatest philosopher in India. And they ask him, what is it up there? Who is he? Did I tell you that? Who is he up there? What is that? They don't know what it is. They're scared of it. It's, enough, it's omnipotence. It's, it's, it's un, they, say, they say, it, it, not he. They say, it. It is untouchable, unknowable, unmanifest, unapproachable. Every one of them are wrong. <laughs> Every one of them are wrong. But that's what they think. And they get so scared about that. And, and the greatest philosopher of India. Uh, I wish I could get his name. Sandra Karachi or something like that. Anyway, and, and, and they said, what is it? Tell us, what is it? You want to know what it is? Let's listen to a Hindu. Let's let the Hindus tell you what it is. You know what they said? And this great philosopher finally, after years, when they were be the gurus were begging him to tell them about what it is, and he finally decided he would tell them. And so he told them, and he said, it's, it's neti, neti. Neti. What's neti? Not that. Not that. Isn't that wise? Beautiful. <laughs> what is it? Not that. In other words, anything you say it is, not that. Not that. I don't know what it is, but it's not that. See? <laughs> but hear me preach say, not that. See? The greatest Chinese philosopher ever known, Lao Tse. L-A-O hyphen T-S-E. They wanted him to say, what is it? What is it up there? And they finally, after years, prevailed on him to tell the world with his great wisdom what that is up there. Aren't you glad you know God? Yeah. We know God. We know God through Jesus. We, that's how we know God. That's the only way we know God. And, and they said, tell us, what is it? What is it? And, and after long months, they finally prevailed for him to come public with his great secret knowledge. And do you know what he told him it was? I don't know the Chinese word for it, but they told him it, it, it's silence. Ain't that beautiful? That'll make you adjust your glasses. Silence. Wow. Ain't that wonderful? Silence. Why'd they say silence? Kind of like the Hindus, because they said any human word or sound that can be made on this planet of any kind whatsoever, forget it. That don't tell what it is. No, silence, silence. They were everywhere preaching that stuff. Jesus, the young philosopher, comes to town from Nazareth. He has his little crowds of people. You know, they follow him. You ever get a picture of him like that? Think of him as a young philosopher? Well, why not? We know he was teaching truth. But the people thought he was a philosopher. And thought he was a nice philosopher. And they liked to get in this crowd and follow him. And they'd find him sometimes. And they'd, and they'd scratch their head. And they'd, some, those old boys, they'd say, where'd this young fellow learn all that? It stumped him. He said, he's so wise, and he's so young, and he knows so much, we never heard such wisdom. Where do you get this? See, they thought he's a philosopher. One day, can't you see him? Oh, bless his name. And up there on the mountainside in this big crowd of people, do you have a picture of that multitude? 
uh, the Sermon on the Mount, we call it, you know. And you see them people up there gathered around, and him said, we always have a picture of him sitting on a nice rock, you know, while he's teaching. <laughs> I, don't th I think he was sweating and waving his arms and everything else. But anyhow, uh, maybe spitting and sputtering like me, but, but, but he, he was telling them good stuff. And this philosopher had a big crowd. Wonderful. And the, and the Jews around the edge, they were saying, this guy really got, even though, even though we don't know where in the world he learned all this stuff. He hasn't been to the university or nothing. And, uh, and, uh, but but it, it's really interesting stuff, he says. We never heard anybody talk like this. Never heard anything like this. And, 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 and so, some of them went their way, and the, he dismissed his crowd. And what happened? He dismissed his crowd. And what happened? What happened? Come on, you know what happened. Your, your Bible tells what happened. And he came down from the mountain, and behold, a leper fell before him and said, Master, have mercy on me. You can cure me if you will. And Jesus, moved with compassion, comes near, puts his hands on him, and I think maybe embraces him and says, I will be clean. That separated Jesus from all the philosophers. Hallelujah. 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 On Easter Day, we have a risen Christ. We don't serve a dead religion, a Jesus who is alive. You believe that? But you see, we go out there and preach and, 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 and we tell them he bore our sins and he bore our diseases. And that's crazy. How do you know that? How do you know that? What are you telling us? No, he didn't bear my sickness. I feel it now. It's hurting right there on my left side under that rib. It's hurting. You tell me he bore it 2,000 years. Come on. Don't be crazy. Philosophy. What's the difference? Then we back up and we pray to God. And we talk to God. And were confirmed, approved of God by signs and miracles and wonders. And we pray to God. And God does wonders. I've told you before, every crusade I've ever conducted. Were you there the first night in Kiev? Yeah, you saw me do it, didn't you? I've done that every crusade I've ever conducted all these 56 years. The first night I preach about all that Jesus did when he was here. I healed the sick. He came as the Son of God and did all that good stuff. And then these wicked people crucified him. And then they, they, they buried him. But that God raised him from the dead. And he gathered his followers together and said, Now I've come back from the dead. I love you. Now I want you to go tell the whole world. And I'm going to give you power to do it. Don't go to get this power. And then go to the whole world. And I always tell that. The first time I preached it, the first time in Kiev, remember that? And, and, and then... And then I get them all ready. And they're ready to believe. I've got them in my hand. I could make a call. They'd believe right then. And I always say, now wait a minute. But before I, I, I always tell them, I'm frank. I say, my purpose in coming to your city is to persuade you to believe on Jesus Christ of the Bible and have the peace that I have. But I don't want to ask you to decide about him. The preachers are all ready to go. They're ready for me to make an altar call. No, 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 no. I say, not yet. Not yet. First, let me pray. Let me pray. Let me pray to God according to this book that I carry in my hand. And let me ask him to do things that no witch doctor, I didn't say that over there because they don't have witch doctors over there so much, but, but, but usually I say that. No witch doctor or no physician, nobody, no soothsayer, no hypnotist, no psychologist, I said all that. None of those can do. Let me pray for God to do some things like that. Otherwise, how do we know he's alive? And you wouldn't want to quit your religion and accept another dead religion. That wouldn't do you any good. And I wouldn't have the right to come over here and ask you to quit your religion and accept mine if mine wasn't better, you know. But how do you know it's better? Let me pray. Let me do what that book says. That book says Jesus died for our sins. That book says Jesus took our diseases. That book says Jesus loves you. Let me pray. Let's see if he'll prove it. And I pray. And never in 56 years have I ever done it yet. But what? God 
unanswered prayer. And before long, the platform is full of people coming to tell what God has done for them. God wants the world to know that Jesus is not dead like Muhammad. He's alive. Easter. Different than any religion in the world. Easter guarantees our faith. We live because He lives. I'm telling you, I'm a believer in Easter. Oh boy, I'm a believer in Easter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I didn't finish reading this. Wait a minute, listen. Back to uh, Romans chapter 6. Now, if, verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Him, we believe we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Right? Death has no more dominion over Him. Us either. Hallelujah. For in that He died, He died unto sin once. But... In that he lives, he lives to God. In other words, that's all the time. That, that life is going on all the time. Now, likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed to sin. You do that? You do that? Yeah, I do. I'm dead to sin. But alive to God through Jesus Christ. See, there he explains it. See, it, it's now. We died with Him. We live with Him. Because He lives, we live. Reckon yourself by faith dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Every day I'm alive with the life of God because Jesus came back from the dead because he lives I live do you believe that yes. well, let me just say a few things over here oh I gotta skip most of this I can't get this sermon preached my this is a good sermon if I could ever preach it those I gotta read a little bit so since okay Romans chapter 8 verse 2 verse 1 so now there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ <laughs> <laughs> Say, I'm not condemned. I'm, condemned. I'm, happy. I'm happy. I stand before God before with, God. Peace. with peace. No inferiority. No, inferiority. no, intimidation. no intimidation. No fear. No, fear. no, guilt. no guilt. No shame. No shame. Not, because not because of me, but because of Him. Because His, of righteousness His righteousness imputed to me. Indeed. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that. So, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God. So now there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, Romans 8. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life makes us free from the law of sin and death. Beautiful. That's what it does. There's a new law working in me. You believe that? Verse 5, Living Bible says, th this is interesting. Listen to this. Verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on sinful desires. That's pretty true, isn't it? But those who live according to God's Spirit, say, I'm listening. Those who have their minds, those who live according to God's Spirit have their minds set on what God desires. Isn't that beautiful? That's what keeps me happy. My precious wife went to heaven six years ago. I'm so lonely without her. But, 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 see, it won't do me any good to sit around and whine. The world is hurting. And I know good stuff. So my mind is set on what God desires. And so that keeps me happy all the time. Chapter 8, verse 6. The mind of a sinful person leads to death. But the mind, controlled by God's Spirit, leads to life and peace. How many of you in here have learned that? You came from a wrecked life, from a life that was no good, and today you're good. Yeah. 
what stories could be told out of this place. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, is he in you? Yes. He's in me. If Christ is in you, your spirit is alive with God's righteousness. Ain't that beautiful? Yeah. Righteousness. Remember what I told you it is? The ability to stand in the presence of God without the sense of fear or guilt or shame or inferiority. He did that to us because of his cloak of righteousness that's put on us. We can stand before him without shame. So, so if Christ is in you, your spirit is alive with God's righteousness. Verse 11, and if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead is dwelling in you, then he who raised Christ will give life to your mortal bodies, physical, right now. You see, I said, it's not resurrection day, now. He'll give life to your, that's healing, that's healing. God don't want us sick. Amen. If you're sick, give it up right now. Give it up right now. Say, wow, I, I, I'm tired of it. I, I, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the cures. I'm tired of the drugstores. I'm tired of the doctors. I'm tired of the prescriptions. Give it up. Give it up. Surrender it like you'd surrender a sin. I don't want to compare it to a sin. But I mean, give it up. Abandon it. Give it up. Turn your back on it. Say, I'm fed up with it. I'm through with it. If the, light, the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead. These aren't just religious words that I quote when I go to church. I believe it. I believe it. If that spirit of him dwells in me, then he who raised Christ will give life to my mortal body by his spirit who lives in me. Say, he gives life to me, to my mortal body by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I'm alive with his righteousness, his righteousness in me right now. Me right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then you sang the rest of it tonight. Uh, uh, verse 11, then come down, verses 29 and 30. For God knows us, and God has called us, and God has justified us, and God has glorified us. What more can you ask? We have that inheritance. We don't have to beg for that. That is ours. Verse 31, so what shall we say in response to all of this? <laughs> and you know what it says, don't you? If God be for us, the poor devil's up against it. If God be for us, who can be against us? And that's why you can look the devil between the horns and say, get lost, Slewfoot. I'm in charge here. And he'll back off from you when you believe that. And if you, if you believe it quite a bit tonight, but you think you don't believe it quite as much as I do, it's working on you all the time. Two or three weeks down the way, you're going to forget how you used to not believe. And it'll grow on you. Hallelujah. And your faith will be stronger and stronger. Big facts. Big facts. Big facts. Jesus died for you, for me. Big facts. God raised Jesus from the dead to justify my faith. Big facts. Easter is a big fact of redemption. We celebrate the greatest event in Christianity that separates us. Without Easter, without resurrection, then we Congregate with the Shintoists and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims. And you can't tell the difference. We just got different stories to tell, but we're all a bunch of philosophers. But for the resurrection, Muhammad didn't come back from the dead. Yeah, I know he worshipped the God that we worship, the Allah of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but when he died, he died. Because he didn't follow Jesus. He didn't believe, he didn't, he didn't believe the story of Jesus. <laughs> we believe. We believe. And the devil's in trouble. Because when you believe 
in the resurrection, you believe the heartbeat of the gospel. That's the pulse beat of the gospel. And that's what the devil cannot stand up against. He cannot stand up against anyone who believes that Jesus Christ came back from the dead because his coming back from the dead justified our faith. And so then we can square our shoulders and stand up in God's presence and, and, and His righteousness is imputed to us. And He says, you're okay, daughter. You're okay, son. Stand strong. Hallelujah. I love you. Good for you. You're redeemed. You're loved. You're, 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 you're reconciled. You're paid for. You're mine. My son's resurrection justifies your faith. Big facts. Jesus died for you. Big facts. God raised him from the dead for you. Big facts. He came and showed himself alive. Right? Showed himself alive. Big facts. He comes to live in you. Big facts. You believe that? <laughs> if you only believe on it. I got to quit. I'm getting to my sermon. And now I'm ready to preach that sermon. Last Sunday, last year I tried to preach it. I still haven't got to it. What happens if he's not risen? But that's too much to get into tonight. I just tell you, I'm so happy. Easter makes me so happy. I preach Easter around the world. Uh, almost always I'm overseas at Easter time. I'll tell you, it's the day I love to preach to the people. And then, and then pray for them. And let them see that this Jesus that came back from the dead is alive. How do we know he died for our sins? Look what he does. Look what he does. He does the impossible. Oh, I love it when they bring those witch doctors and all them, them sick people. And God heals them. No witch doctor in the world can do it. No Hindu in the world. No, no Buddhist in the world. No Shintoist in the world. Ever went out and gathered his followers and give a nice speech and told them now I will pray to the gods that I've told you about and they will come and descend and do supernatural miracles that no doctor can do and you will know that what I've told you is the truth none in the world ever had that idea that's the essence of Christianity Moses did it. Elijah did it. Jesus got the idea from the Old Testament prophets. He come from God. He did it everywhere he went. He said, if you don't like me, at least you know I come from God because look at the works I'm doing. Nobody, uh, the blind man had enough sense to know that. He said, wait a minute. You, John chapter 9. You say he's of the devil? You say he's no good. You say he's a sinner. That's in your Bible, John chapter 9. You say he's a sinner. Well, that's strange. He scratched his head. His blue eyes, he could see. You know, he said, it's strange to me. I never heard of any sinner that could open blind eyes. He said that. And the, the old rabbis got so mad. They said, shut up, you fool. Are you trying to teach us? But see, he had good sense. How, 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 how can you say he's a sinner? Friends? He's not a sinner. He's the son of God. He's our savior. He's our healer. He's our friend. We're his friends. He reconciled us. He paid for us and restored us and gathered us back to him and the father and manifests himself to us and comes among us and says, when you love me, I love you. I come to you. I love you. He's alive. He's real. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No other religion in the world has ever done that. But that is the essence of Christianity. And that is why T.L. Osborne stands before you tonight happy. I've been to, I've been to 80, about 83 countries now. Never seen it fail. Never. Why? God wants those people to know. And if I can get to Yakutia, <laughs> hallelujah, and to Kinov, and to uh, Uzbekistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Kazakhstan and what all the other kinds and the Kidovs and the Lord, Lord, Lord only knows what. The Archangel, you know, if I can get there, God will do the same. And preachers sometimes, uh, you know, preachers that don't know much, 
they'll sit back and scowl and say, you're em embarrassing us and you're tempting God to talk like that. And I say, no, God's up there clapping his hands. Say, go for it, T.L. Now I've been wanting someone to tell him that. He wants the world to know that he's alive. And we're the tellers. We're the showers. We're like Jesus. We're not philosophers. We run around and we have our little crowds all right. And they come to us and hear our teaching. But when they need a miracle, we can get it. We can get it. Any of us can get it. We know how. We're believers. We're the children of God. We're redeemed. We're paid for. We didn't do it ourselves. He did it for us. And now we're not guilty. We're righteous before God. Are you taking this in tonight? My friends, I'm talking to you out of my heart. You know, there's a woman that comes to our church in Tulsa. A good woman. A Pen I don't like to say that, but a Pentecostal woman. Uh, sounds like, okay. A Pentecostal woman. <clears throat> and, 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 and she came and, and, and every Sunday morning, you know, raise their hands and make a good confession to God and lead them in prayer and in praise and all this good stuff. How we love God and God, you love us. Thank you. And she couldn't do that. That scared the fire out of her when she first came. She didn't know what to do. She ducked her head. She covered her face. She, was, she couldn't do that. Pentecostal woman. But see, she'd been sitting on a preacher that didn't teach like you're teaching here. And she was afraid of God. She thought she had the Holy Ghost thought she was saved and afraid to confess all this to God. Didn't know how. You know there's people like that? They don't understand. They think I'm sacrilegious. No, 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 no. We're friends with God. He loves us. He walks with us. He's in us. He works with us. We're partners. He don't have any hands but yours. He don't have any voice but yours. What do you want him to do? Come down here in a cloud? Yeah. Send him around? You can't do that. You can pray your head off and fast your head off. You can't get God to come down here and run around and do things you, he told you to do. No. People waste, waste most of their prayer life praying for two things that God will never answer. Number one, they pray for things that God told them to do. They're trying to get him to do. Another thing, they pray for God to do for what he's already done. He's not going to do either one. You can pray your head off and it won't work. You understand that? We're his partners. He's not going to come down here in spirit. If he did, he'd scare you. Read your Bible. They thought they got close to him, they fell or they fainted or they got scared or something. Uh, be the same today. It'd scare the fire out of people. You know, they, they, they wouldn't know what to do. See, God's got a problem. What's he going to do about it? We've got the solution. Are we going to cooperate? Hey, you know what God says? He says, hey, come on, my child. I've redeemed you. I brought you to me. I paid for you. You're beautiful. I believe in you. You've got everything that I need. I'll make a deal. I'll give you my spirit if you'll give me your flesh. And we'll have a Christian. That's what a Christian is. God's spirit and our flesh. Hallelujah. And then... Our hands are his hands. Our ears are his ears. We hear the cry of needy. That's what's bugging uh, Austin. He's looked in the eyes of people. A young man ordained to the ministry. A lot of you feel the same way that he felt. See, that's wonderful. We're hooked up with God. You believe that? It's resurrection. It's Easter. You're not a philosopher. You're not, you don't hold a philosophy. No, what you got's real. What you believe is real. What I'm thinking about right now is, I wish everybody in here that's not right with God, that don't know about this, would let me pray for you so you could have it. Mm, I want you to have it. I know you can have it if I can pray for you. No question about it. I hope I don't sound like a stranger to you. No, I love God. I'm not scared of God. 